Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be on painting realistically to level up your manga in Clip Studio Paint, and it will be presented by Colin Chan. Before we begin the webinar, there are a few housekeeping items that I'd like to review with everyone. First of all, the webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. The Q&A session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded. The recording will be shared on social media and will be sent to all registrants and attendees. The panelists today are myself, Fahim Niaz, Joanna Brower, Mario Quinones, and Colin Chan, your presenter. Before we begin the webinar and the presentation, for those of you who are new to Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready-to-publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. To learn more about Clip Studio Paint, please visit us at clipstudio.net forward slash en or at graphicsly.com. And with that, we will be passing the reins of the webinar over to Colin, who will discuss painting realistically to level up your manga in Clip Studio Paint. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the lovely introduction. So my name is Colin Chan. First and foremost, I want to say thank you for all the people that are here and uh, taking the time out of your day to come in here to hopefully try, I can try to teach you guys something. So first and foremost, what you guys are looking at is my Instagram. Um, as you can see, I come from a traditional and digital background. And so a little bit more information about myself. Um, I graduated art school, but uh, I can say that art school didn't teach me the fundamentals to drawing and painting. And if you want to know more about how I learned that, I would definitely tell you guys to head over to the Graphicsly interview that I did, and you can find out more about how I started to learn about uh, the fundamentals of drawing and painting. Um, so when it comes to work experience, um, I was a freelance storyboard artist in the TV commercial industry. I've uh, worked on commercials for Dodge, um, Craft Singles, Big Brother Canada, and uh, yeah, and then I decided to kind of quit and pursue filmmaking independently. And so I created some short films. I was capable of getting into festivals all across North America. Um, actually won Best Short uh, in a festival here in Toronto, Canada, and that was kind of fun. And during that time, I was introduced to live streaming and I was live streaming on Twitter's Periscope app and I was actually the first visual artist to be featured on that application and I was actually one of the top art broadcasters on that platform as well um, but one thing that that live streaming taught me was uh, the power of the internet and how I'm capable of kind of displaying my work and showing my work not just locally but now you can show it worldwide and that kind of leads today where um, that has now turned into, recently I became a Wacom influencer and <clears throat> they're the ones that introduced me to the lovely people at Graphicsly and they allowed me to try Clip Studio uh, Paint and I've only been using it for about two months. So with that being said, um, this was actually the very first piece that I created on Clip Studio Paint. Um, when you look at it, um, it's not your typical piece that you would see uh, artists create on this uh, beautiful application. Um, it definitely has a lot more painterly and realism to it, but you know, to the lovely people at Graphically and Clip Studio, they thought it was, it's great to show diversity in this program. So this was the first piece that I created and um, we're gonna continue to move on to show a little bit more. And this piece right here, oops, I erased it. Uh, so this piece right here is kind of me pushing it a little further. Um, and I was trying out some brush packs, uh, the ultimate brush pack and also the superhero brush pack. And I decided to create this piece, which is something that I prefer to do. And I really want to push uh, myself in this program to see if Clip Studio was capable. And as you can see, it is 100% capable. And this piece right here is actually one of my most recent pieces. Um, it's called Down, Not Out. And you can learn more about that. I do tell a story about 
this illustration. And this again was 100% created on the lovely Clip Studio Paint Pro, okay? So now what I'm gonna be teaching you guys is how realism is going to help your manga, right? And for me to kind of start, I need to teach you guys about understanding the fundamentals to drawing and painting, okay? So the first thing and the first slide I'm gonna be talking about is when you first make a mark on your canvas, your paper, whatever you're drawing on, that is technically called a gesture. So what you're seeing here on this page is I've created a bunch of different gestures um, and gestures can also help you with, you know, illustrating rhythm. So when you look at a piece like uh, this right here, you can see that there's a certain rhythm of when there's a curve here, there's a counter curve here. And it kind of gives you this rhythm, a rhythmic, rhythmic kind of way of looking at uh, your object or your, your model. Um, another way is movement. So with a piece like this, you can see that you can learn things like contraposta. And those are little kind of technical terms, but you can see that the movement kind of describes the gravity from the top of the ear to the bottom of the ankle here, right? With a single stroke. And now when you're looking at all of these things, there's multiple ways of trying to gesture or gesturing, right? You can have one with energy where there's a lot of lines. You could have one that's more flowy and kind of singular line, not picking up your pencil pen or your stylus. Uh, you can have shapes, you know, you can have boxes. Maybe perhaps it's more like you want to have more circular or sphere-like, or perhaps maybe it's just simple basic lines uh, guidelines or uh, constructive lines. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that there is multiple approaches to gesturing and there is no right or wrong way. All right, so my definition of what a gesture is, it's a roadmap in which an artist that's creating, it's for them to kind of see where they're kind of going in this journey. Um, so for instance, when you look at a gesture like this, you may not know what it is, but to me, I can, technically tell that it's a still life. And if I wanted to make, you know, a skull here, or perhaps it is a cylinder, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't really describe anything until I really start to go into it uh, more in depth. Uh, but a gesture is more for general uh, generalizing, but also it's really for drawing what you see and drawing what you know in a loose form. And again, it's like a map for you. And, really trained artists can actually see gestures and be like, oh, I can see where this artist is going. Um, now, if you've never ever uh, drew before, I would always advise people to kind of draw in this fashion when you're first starting to learn gesturing. Uh, the reason is most of the times, like including myself, when I first was uh, drawing uh, in life drawing, you know, I would, you know, singly use a single line and try to like, you know, draw this kind of figure and try to figure out, you know, what's going on. Um, I do have a little tip for people like that, and, and I usually give the same tip to people I'm teaching, where if you're coming at it with a single line, right, uh, my metaphor is pretend we're playing darts, and each line is a dart, and your target is the model. So when you're trying to hit that target, if I said, if you're only throwing one or two lines at that target, what are your chances of actually hitting that target. Guarantee you when you do the percentage, it's less than 50%. But if you throw in a lot of line, just like this one up here, you're capable of saying, hey, you know what? This line is the perfect line or that line is actually where it connects to the ankle and X, Y, Z. But <clears throat> when you're first starting, it definitely shows um, that your lack of knowledge, because I didn't know anything either. I didn't know anything about gestures, didn't know anything about proportions, didn't know about anatomy, nothing. So our first initial thing to do is to kind of outline things because that's, I guess, the way that we are all kind of built inside to kind of see things singularly, right? So again, that's gesturing as a whole. And now once you're done doing your gestures, the next step, you're like, okay, I do my gesture, what's next? The next step is actually boxes, okay? So once you're done your gesture, I would then tell you to throw box 
a box or a 3D box over it. And we all, when we were kids, we all knew this little trick, right? I'm pretty sure, right? This was the very first time that we all probably do something in 3D. And that actually is what boxes are kind of built off of. So in this corner piece here, uh, boxes are definitely a solid tool to kind of help you with perspective. So when you look at this piece, you can see that I use these rectangular boxes as buildings. And if I zoom in, you can actually see that I drew little people right here and, you know, showing you scale. Okay. And again, it's a definite tool that will help you push your work into a more 3D look on a 2D surface. Um, these are other examples of what you can use boxes for. So, you know, helps you with your uh, portraits. Perhaps you're trying to draw a truck or anything that's like mechanical, it usually starts with a box. You can learn about proportions, uh, human anatomy proportions through these boxes. You can take really complex things. A lot of people always have hard times drawing feet and hand. But what I tell them is if you break it down with simple boxes, and understanding planes is going to help you simplify things and it's going to be easier to illustrate to kind of show people when they look at your work that hey it's not a flat piece of foot it's actually a foot that kind of goes in and and you can see it uh, reside and, and and feel more realistic is what i'm trying to say um, you can also do really really technical um, boxes in a sense of kind of describing human anatomy so this is a pelvis and you can actually break it down where it looks more mechanically, but again, it's a lot simpler to kind of understand visually, okay? Um, one thing that I can definitely say that boxes are really helpful, and a lot of the time when I see artists create artwork, they do have issues with foreshortening. If you don't know what foreshortening is, foreshortening is kind of creating an illusion of an object receding back. So when it comes to like this piece, you can see that the chin is the closest and then the forehead resides further back, all right? And if you pay attention, the box actually simplifies that so that it's a solid tool to help you kind of like a guideline to make you understand that, hey, forehead's here, chin's the closest to me. And boxes are definitely a tool that I would say, it took me years to kind of master this, and it's not gonna take you overnight to try to get this, all right? It's always great to kind of study these things as well. Um, I did create a YouTube video uh, talking about boxes, even though I'm giving you this quick rundown. Um, if you wanna know more about it, definitely go over to my YouTube channel, uh, check out the last three videos. It talks really in depth about box drawings and how you are capable of using technical illustrations, you know, building things like a sphere, uh, which is using boxes, okay? Um, another quick little thing that boxes can totally help is environment drawings as well. Um, it can actually help you when you're looking at scale or, or relationships. So I drew this character right here, and if I wanted to draw, you know, just say like a little table, you can actually, again, uh, make it more scalable and more realistic kind of falling into that as well. But knowing that if he, he or she stands up, you can actually gauge certain things. Or you can use realism of knowledge of knowing that a door frame is about eight feet and you can say, okay, this is about eight feet. So if this character stands up, it has to be, or that character is about six feet, five feet, however you wanna do it. Again, scaling totally, totally helps. Okay, so you have your gestures, you throw your boxes. What's after that? After that is, blocking. So one thing I do want to mention is <clears throat> when it comes to uh, blocking uh, or these topics, well, yeah, generally these topics are general topics, but inside these topics, there are a lot of subtopics, but I broke it down so it's simple where it's just these four topics that you just have to practice. And within those topics, there can be, you know, finer, uh, finer topics, I guess you would say, or subtopics, more like for instance, so when I'm blocking, so right now, if I, oh, sorry, let me re reset that one. When it comes to blocking, one thing about blocking is about laying down general compositions and learning color harmony, okay? So you don't have to worry about details. So for instance, I'm gonna be blocking this face here. And as you can see, again, gesture, box, and then now I'm blocking. So blocking, as you can see, is I'm just putting general shapes and shadows. 
and I'm telling myself that this is all dark and I'm just gonna again continue to push it and you can again play around you know turn around erase etc and a general blocking looks like that where you're kind of learning about the shapes of within the face and then you can actually start to go even deeper and start to refine those shapes and start to play with more uh, of the shadows and start to really begin to push out more details of the face and again just using simple shapes and using simple shadows to kind of describe and again you can use this for painting as well painting you do this a lot and if people want to know the difference between painting and drawing painting is if you want to erase you have to add more paint uh, drawing you could just erase okay so that's blocking there uh, another one here is if I were to do a sphere all right you block here and then I know again learning the values all right that's the shadow and that's where that is right there and again it's generalizing and then you would go deeper with more refined shading uh, another thing too is you can learn uh, color theory from this so this also could work in a sense of learning to put base colors down to see what kind of color harmony works and what doesn't work. So here's a example of me locking in this little landscape piece and you can play with it. So does this pink go with this green tree, mm -hmm. right? And you can start to kind of understand the values of it and that's uh, the importance of blocking. And also, you know, again, refining it, using it in anatomy. Um, you can also kind of play with the lighting in a sense of if you wanted to darken up the background, you can then see the values and the relationships as well. Okay, like so. And again, simple hands, hands are always difficult, but if you start to block it, you can see how simple it is where now all of a sudden I laid down a very basic understanding of lighting and it helps with the planes light is on top of the fingers and on the side is dark okay so that is blocking and now we go to the very final piece which is so you have your gesture you throw your boxes on top of your gestures to make them see if your perspective is correct if it's uh you know more more 3d more dynamic um, and then you start to render by blocking and then refining those blockings and then the very, very end, in my opinion, is lines. So now lines, they can do multiple things, right? Lines are definitely the finer details is what I would say. So when you look at this eye here, you can start to see that I am using lines to describe the eyes, but also having subtle uh, subtleties in it. So for instance, when you go into the pupil, you can actually see I drew some lines to kind of describe uh, the the shading with inside the the eyes. Um, there is also directional plane, um, which I am using right here, where I'm describing the form with just simple lines. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You also have directional lines as well. So this would be you know going one way and then we're changing it. And when your eyes are looking at it, we are going up, over, and then over and then out again. So you can use these lines to kind of describe directional plane changes as well. Um, another one is line quality. So you are always trying to get like something really smooth like that when you're drawing, right? Instead of kind of a scribble and, 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 and jaggedy lines and all this kind of stuff. But the basis thing of line quality is you wanna make it look as crisp and as clean as possible. Um, you can also use lines in more of a chaotic way, and you can actually, you know, start to uh, shade and start to kind of bring things forth and backwards through the chaos of this crazy shading here, all right? Or another thing is you can definitely have confidence. Um, one thing that I can say is line confidence is something that's real. So when you see this piece, there's 11 lines here that makes this kind of Hitchcock-inspired uh, portrait. And now one thing I do want to mention is sometimes you'll see master artists, they kind of go in with that, right? Where they know what they do and they're just dropping it in and they're skipping, uh, you know, 
gestures, boxes, and blocking. They just jump in and they're just dropping these lines like bang, 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 and there's a face. What you guys need to understand that these artists have been studying these fundamentals for years upon years, that they technically see it without even drawing in. So it may look like a magic trick to us, but to them, it's they see it, all right? Um, I'm gonna give you guys some examples of using line again. So when this piece, if you know Fortnite or um, Marshmallow, I kind of did a mashup between a Fortnite character and Marshmallow. And with this piece, you can see my line quality in here and you can see how I'm using line to kind of help push this illustration. So when you look at the cloak, you know, there is some directional um, lines where it's kind of describing the form. You can also look at the crown and start to see that I'm using jagged lines to kind of show the imperf imperfectness to that crown that he's wearing. Maybe it was a battle, maybe there's something that kind of dented it. Um, but the basis as well is using lines to finish off the piece. And this piece is more closer to the comic and manga illustration way of doing things. Um, but once again, if you look carefully, there's boxes, there's, um, you know, there's a gesture under there and then blocking, the refined blocking. And then the last thing I put on is the lines. Now, if people want to know more of kind of a realistic approach to using lines, um, here's this piece. And um, when you look at this piece that I created, it's a sketch of an ape. Again, if you look carefully now, your eyes should have a general understanding after me telling you what to look for. So you can see that there's a gesture here. You can see that there is a box just faded away right here. And then most importantly, if you look at where the eyebrows of this ape is, you can actually see that I blocked it out. But I definitely use lines to kind of describe its, uh, the, the monkey's fur, but also using kind of like shading, line shading to kind of give it a medium tone to the ape as well. And, you know, again, using lines to put a little highlight of the whiskers or even to pull out the chin. So when it comes to that, that's how I would use lines. And literally, ladies and gentlemen, like that is the steps to learning the fundamentals of drawing and painting. You can use those um, tools and, and, and steps to actually help create more realistic work. So it's literally, there's nothing more or less when it comes to, to those fundamentals. It's actually practicing those and, and mastering those. And I guarantee you, your work will start to progress further, okay? So now knowing about realism, the thing that I do wanna mention now is, okay, so we now understand the fundamentals to drawing and painting. So how do we study realism, right? And why I think it's really important for you guys to be studying from real life and not photos. Now. I know it's a little hypocritical, a little weird that I'm telling you guys not to study from a photo and I'm showing you guys a photo. So I apologize if, it, if it's throwing you guys off. But what I wanted to talk about here is when you look at this photo, it looks fine. We see a camera sitting on the floor. It's good. It's, it, it looks like a solid reference photo to use when it comes to drawing. But I'm going to tell you there's a problem with it. And that problem is there's distortion. There's very, very little distortion uh, in your perspective when cameras are involved. When cameras are taking pictures, there's always a certain distortion to it, okay? So in order for me to kind of show you guys this, um, let me show you what happens if I draw a line. Oops, sorry. If I draw a line from here to here, okay? That's a straight line, but you can see that the back is kind of a bit off. And now when we are following lines of the camera, you can start to see that the camera in itself is leaning in this direction. And then if you are looking at these back lines here, focal lines or the horizon lines, and they're kind of making the camera now look like it's leaning and falling off. So without these, these ruler guidelines, it looked normal. So what would happen is you would, if you didn't have the knowledge of those fundamentals and didn't have the knowledge of perspective, what's going to happen is you're gonna render this, you're going to draw this or paint this, 
and it's going to turn out a little uh, distorted. All right. And now let me show you another example where I use my nephew. Um, and I decided to put the perspective lines of a box. And I'm following, if you pay attention, I'm following my PC up here. So again, if I zoom in, you can see a slight distortion right here line right and that's a corner of a wall now people can say well it, it depends on if you're using a tripod and if you're using you know maybe your your hand was crooked again yes sure but there's slight distortion no matter how straight your camera is uh, because once again a camera lens is taking that information and either shrinking it down so that your sensors can pick it up so that's kind of the issue when it comes to steadying um, using photos because again if you were to illustrate draw paint any of this and use this as is you're gonna start to realize that there's there's something that may be off with your piece of art okay now knowing that there is distortions in your pictures if you're using photo references okay how do you study uh, realism I guess right how do you how what, what is the best way to study so again I'm using these photo references um, a lot of time people are like I can't afford life drawing classes I can't afford a, a model um, how how can I practice these fundamentals because my mom and dad they don't sit still my dog moves my fish moves you know it's just I, I don't have that kind of figurative uh, work in front of me well just like the masters before us um, they use still life and why are they using still life? Well, it's because it's still and it's never going to move. Um, so you may not have a, a, a skull like I do, but again, I'm using this as an example and I want to use this for lighting purposes. Um, when you're setting up your still life, I would definitely say use any household objects. Try to get them um, to have like a, a white color or even just a single color. Nothing with little little trinkets or any kind of details on it. You just want something plain and basic, just like how I use this blue ping pong ball and this uh, rectangular styrofoam um, box. And I just threw up a black background, put it on the floor, and I used one light source where the light is coming from here and it's just shooting down. And try to get yourself in a darker room so that you can start to really steady um, the shadows, okay? So one thing that I'm trying to say here is you would be practicing the same four techniques that I've already said about the, the drawing and painting. And what I would tell you to do to help yourself is if just say if you were to try to practice, you know, you have a skull and you're trying to practice this still life. What I would tell you to do in one whole week, so Monday to Sunday, you would do like a 360 view. So one, one part you would start right here and then you would just practice your gesturing, right? trying to understand, like I told you, try to throw as many lines as possible and all that kind of good stuff, all right? Do one whole week of studying that perspective and you're studying, you're studying. So you're gonna come with however many drawings you have that are all full of gestures. Then the next thing that I would tell you to do is take those same uh, gestures, go to that same position that you drew on and then start to add your boxes above your gesturing. And that is practicing for a whole week is what I would say. Okay, and then, then the next step is of course blocking. And then the next one after that is line work. But the basis idea when you're using still life is you're using household objects and you're practicing those exact same fundamental techniques that I'm telling you guys to practice on. Okay, oh, okay. Um, and then what I do wanna talk about now is trying out traditional mediums, right? So why is it important for you to try brushes like um, or traditional mediums such as acrylic paint, watercolor, inks, oils, uh, markers, pencils, graphite? Maybe you can't afford it, that's fine. But a lot of those tools that I'm naming, you can actually go to your dollar store and buy uh, you know, cheap acrylic paint and practice with that. So the reason why I think you should practice or try traditional medium before or even after using a digital platform is because it's about knowledge, right? So just like the gesture, the more knowledge you have, you're able to kind of put into your work. It's the same kind of thing when it comes to mediums. 
So if you're drawing and painting with oils or digital oils, you kind of want to know how real oils kind of interact. Because when you come onto this platform, perhaps the oils isn't really feeling like oils. Maybe it feels more like acrylic. So it's to help you push your work a little further when it comes to uh, your knowledge base and showing people that you have a certain knowledge. And now with this piece here, this was fully completed uh, using the Ultimate Brush Pack and the Superhero Brush Pack. So when you look at this, when I started to use this, I was looking at the splatters and I was like, man, these splatters look really cool. It, it definitely has a very ink-like kind of feel. And um, I think I want to add these elements because I am also inspired by Jackson Pollock. Um, also enjoy um, in impressionistic and expressionism um, artwork. So I kind of throw that in as well in my pieces. Um, and you can see there's certain elements to those um, genres of art in my piece. And I'm able to achieve those because again, I've tried it on a traditional platform and then brought it over on a digital platform. So always, always, always when you're jumping in to um, a new program or have new brushes from Clip Studio, I've always advised you to like try out the brushes, right? Like, what does this gouache brush feel like, right? Oh, okay, cool. It kind of gives me like a pastel feel when I lightly push on it. And again, I am using a Wacom uh, stylus and it is 100% uh, hand pressure instead of screen pressure. So again, it's more realistic when you are drawing or painting. Okay. So again, when you're when you're looking at this, you want to try out as many brushes as you possibly can before you're going to jump in and uh, create your pieces of artwork because it is going to help you with knowledge base. All right. So now we got that. The last thing I want to talk about here is using photos is tracing. A lot of the time people would use a photo and they always say, is tracing bad? Is it cheating? I'm gonna tell you it's not. Uh, the only thing that's cheating is you're cheating yourself from, from learning, okay? And what I mean by that is when you trace an image, what happens is no matter how much detail you put in, if you don't have the knowledge of those fundamentals, like there's no gestures here, there's no boxes here, there's no blocking here, there's only lines, right? And those lines aren't really describing the anatomy. It's not describing the, uh, the boxes in a sense of, does this look 3D? No, it looks flat. So whenever I see people's work, uh, and, and they trace it, I can tell that they're tracing it because the image tends to look flat and they're painting and drawing what they see instead of what they know, okay? So when it comes to this, another thing about realism is that it's really an unforgivable um, genre, I guess you would say. Uh, if if your, your drawing looks nothing real, people are just gonna say it, all right? And if you're missing, um, knowledge in the piece that you're creating that's supposed to be real, people are going to notice it. All right. So again, when you're using uh, photos and if you do decide to trace, understand that you still need to add those elements of understanding the fundamentals to drawing and painting. And uh, another thing I would say too is if you are uh, trying to think that tracing, if anyone says like tracing is cheating again, I usually try to say, let's take a, a profession that actually needs to trace their work, right? Uh, let's talk about tattooing. So a lot of tattoo artists, you know, they tend to uh, tattoo people or portraits of famous people, right? So let's take Frankenstein. We've all seen Frankenstein tattoos, but if we get two different artists, right? One artist has the fundamental knowledge and practices and the other one just kind of outlines and and renders what they see when you look at them side by side they're totally different and why is that well it's because one has more knowledge than the other so what i'm always going to tell you is just remember to um, try to gain as much knowledge as possible but really try your best to practice these fundamentals it is tedious it is not going to be an overnight thing. It is a long-term thing. And now, now that you guys know 
okay, you guys understand the, the fundamentals of drawing and painting. You guys now know that using uh, reference photos is, 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 is if you don't have those understanding of perspective, you're gonna fall a little short from, from using reference photos. Now, how does all of that help you with, with manga? So with this awesome manga reference that I'm using, we're gonna look at this and what we're gonna pay attention to is it has everything uh, that I talked about fundamentally. There's, well, there was a gesture here. There was definitely boxes and the people are like, well, I don't see the boxes on the head, but there are definitely a box. If you look at it, uh, sorry. If you look at it right here of the hands, you can see that there is, there is a box right here, all right? So again, there's boxes. Oh, what about blocking? Well, if you pay attention, look, there's shapes. There is a shape right here. And like I said, with blocking, you can see one tone. This is the second tone, which is a highlight. And manga is simplified realism, like I said. So three, three separate colors, right? Dark, medium, light. And it's as simple as that. So we are now going to move into the final step, which I am going to do. And this piece right here is I'm going to now deconstruct my realism here. And I'm going to simplify this realism and I'm going to um, finish off this piece. So as you can see, I gestured. Now, I don't have a box on here, but this is what I'm going to say. I see the box. I don't have it on there, but I see the box. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to the next thing, which is I'm going to be blocking. So the last thing I want to talk about before we open up to, to Q&A is that I want to talk to you guys about why does art school, comic book studios, gaming studios, FX studios say that they don't want to see a portfolio with just strictly manga in it? Well, I'm pretty sure now you guys can understand that the reasoning behind that is because they want to see how you are studying and are you able to have those fundamentals of perspective and, uh, you know, of lighting and shading and blocking and all of those things. Are you capable of showing them that? Because in the end, manga, like I said, is just really simplified um, realism. And hopefully um, by the time we're done the Q&A or hopefully before that, I will get this done and you guys can see my little manga inspired piece here. And you can definitely see how I took my realistic painting on top and I am now going to simplify it and bring it to life. Okay, so Joanna, if you are there, you are yes. more than welcome to come on <laughs> in. Hopefully I did okay yeah. on time. I, I think I did yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 absolutely. We're absolutely fine. We have plenty of time to uh, discuss. Excellent, your excellent. Part. Okay, um, let's start from the beginning. Where do you start when you approach a painting? I start the same way. I start with a gesture. Same mm -hmm. kind of, so even when, when it comes to painting, like, like I said, a lot of the time people are always thinking painting and drawing are separate, right? But it's mm -hmm. not. The only real difference is if you want to erase when you're painting, you have to put more paint to get rid of your mistake. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're drawing, you have an eraser. So, yeah. so if, that make, if that doesn't make any sense, uh, I'll show it to you what I mean. So for instance, if I make a mistake, right, like right there, oh, snap, I painted over the line, right? I can technically, because I'm on a digital, I can turn my, my walk and stylus around and erase, but in a painting, what you would tend to do is you would paint off that background, just like so. Mm. So you knock it off and, you, and you're like, technically that's kind of erasing, okay? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's one thing of doing it. But yeah, hopefully that answered that. <laughs> um, where do you get your inspiration from? Like you have uh, a lot of portraits and yeah. um, from like of photos, I would assume, and then you add your own style to it. Um, so when it comes to like, so to be perfectly honest with you, um, my inspiration is is very simple. Um, I actually do talk about it in that same interview in uh, Graphicsly, but it's it's life and knowing that life is really short, and especially since we're all in this pandemic, 
I actually have always lived with the model of um, taking the small things and, and being inspired by them. So, you know, seeing a ray of sunlight or even seeing a beautiful uh, sunset, you know, that inspires me because everything has a story. And even though I do paint a lot of portraits, um, the only reason why I'm painting a lot of portraits is because, especially with social media and online, people tend to not know original, like they don't understand the concept behind like an original painting. So they can look at it and be like, cool. But if you paint someone like Elon Musk, they're like, oh, I know who that is. That's Elon Musk. So they kind of like gravitate towards it is what I would say. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why I paint uh, uh, celebrity portraits and, and fan art. Hmm. How much how much room do you give yourself um, to give these portraits your own touch usually? I I literally I always will put my own uh, signature on it 100%. So um, like I said before, um, I do take a lot of inspiration from you know certain genres like abstract art, right? So when you look at my backgrounds, I definitely add that or um, impressionism and expressionism. All of that is in the background. And what kind of ties it all together is like the figurative part, which is the portrait or the figure. So I kind of like throw that in and throw in my little cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you a one, one layer type person or how do you allow yourself to have more than one layer? Um, I tend to work on two layers. So literally there's a background and then there's the foreground and then literally that's it. I try to keep it very basic and simple. Uh, again, it just comes from trying to keep it to what I've been trained as, as, as a traditional artist, but um, only time I would, and also it gets confusing when you start having like crazy amounts of layers, I tend to be like, oh dang, like I'm pretty sure everyone in here has uh, experienced where they have like five layers and then all of a sudden they're like, I think I'm on the right layer. And then you've been working on that layer for hours and then you realize you were not on the right layer and you're just like, <laughs> Damn it. And you just kind of like poop your, you poop your pants and you're kind of like, well, that sucks. And then you flatten the layer and then you have to go back into it and it's a little headache. So I try to keep it as simple and as uh, basic as possible. Yeah. Do you have any any um, specific features of digital art that you like wh where you think, oh my God, I wish traditional had that? Yes. You. Uh, it's It's literally being able to throw all types of medium on one canvas without waiting for it to dry and then also like it works right so i can throw oils with uh, watercolor or inks on top of oils which in reality that is impossible to do um, so when it comes to a digital platform that's one thing that i really do love is that you're capable of kind of really pushing those mediums a little further right so oils can go only go so far but when you do oil painting digitally you like the skies are the limits um, how much time does it usually take you to finish a piece? Um, so being that I come from a background of a storyboard artist, I can do art pretty quick if I need to, um, but it really depends on the project. So if projects are saying you have like one month to finish this piece, then I, I take that one month. Um, but I tend to be a hard worker, so I, I hate I hate being behind in deadlines. So I never I've never not missed a deadline. So one thing I would definitely say is it really depends on the project time frame. But yeah, mm -hmm. I can I can do it in any time frame that you give me. Okay, that's that's probably a skill many artists would like to have. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that just turns into you know again like when it comes to realism, right? Um, you're taking something that's super complex and then you're bringing it and you're simplifying it uh, to get your manga. But if you've been training your eyes over and over hours on hours, right? And, and the thing is, it's not just based on art. Um, meta, like I, I tend to kind of philosophically look at art as it's not just a, a one type thing. Uh, and what I mean by that is you can apply this theory to anything. So even, you know, doing being a gardener, you know what I mean? And you can, you can, the more knowledge you have on the soil, the plants, it's only going to make your garden more beautiful. So it's the same thing with, with art, right? So the more knowledge you have, uh, the easier it is for you to kind of 
illustrate it for people that don't know what they're looking at. Hmm. Do you ever look at a piece and think like, I thought it was good and then in the end it wasn't? <laughs> yeah, yeah, all my pieces. <laughs> like, one, yeah, no. all my pieces. Yeah, like, because one thing, so I'm going to use a line from, uh, we'll, we'll use a line of a uh, filmmaker, George Lucas, the, the, the guy that created Star Wars. Um, he says, art is never really finished, it's abandoned. And I believe that. So mm -hmm. when I look at my pieces, at a certain point, and this is true, we can, as artists, we can always work on a piece and we can literally do it for 10, 20 years. We just got to work on it a little bit, a little bit, because we believe that we're capable of uh, always making it better through time. It's like wine, right? So it's like with time as artists, we're always going to try to make it better. And yeah, so at a certain point, I realized we, we just get it to that level of like, okay, I think it's done. I'm just going to abandon it. But I guarantee if you show me a piece that I did like last year or six months, I'm going to be like, I can do better. This, that's garbage. Throw it away. <laughs> I spit on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any, any artists in particular that you look up to? Someone's style you really like? Um, so first thing I'll say is I, one thing about me, um, I, I think I might be a very small uh, minority by saying this, is that I don't like the word style. <laughs> I don't oh, think, okay. yeah, like I don't think artists have styles. I think they have signature ways of doing things. But um, most of the artists that I do look up to, they're all dead. So like Da Vinci, um, anyone from the Renaissance period, uh, mm -hmm. Bernini from the Baroque periods, um, a lot of those artists I, I look up to. All the living artists, they're they're great. Um, you know, there are artists that I'm like, oh yeah, they're good work. But I don't look at them being like, I want to be you. <laughs> like I want to be me. But I, I appreciate your work. That's how I kind of go with it, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah. What about you? Do you have a favorite artist? Oh, God. Me? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm very much into the, the contemporary digital art. I don't have, okay. like, it's more, for me, it's more of the, about the stories that people tell with art. Yeah. In many cases. <laughs> no, I, I, I love that. Trust me. Uh, I'm all about that, 100%. Stories, like I said, coming from a, a filmmaking background as well, like I totally love when art has a story. And uh, most of the period time pieces, like the broke period, like they they kind of have stories. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank, like the Goliath and stuff like that, you know, like biblical stuff too. Like those yeah, are kind yeah. of cool. Like, yeah, yeah. So I feel you on that. <laughs> Uh, that, that caught me a bit of guard here. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I, I just enjoy talking to people. So if anyone has questions, like uh, this is what I say. If any of you guys have questions about uh, Wacom, you know, feel free to ask. Like a lot of the time people always say like, what Wacom should I use? So being that I recently am a Wacom ambassador, I've been using Wacom throughout my whole career. Uh, the, the tablet that I'm using right now is the, the biggest and the baddest. It is the Wacom uh, Cintiq Pro 32 on a, a beautiful ergo stand. Um, I wasn't drawing on this before. I, I just recently started to draw on this. Um, I started on it in Tuos. And uh, a lot of the time people will be like, oh, I really need to be drawing on screen because it feels more natural. But what I always tell them is, no, you can do it on an Intuos. Uh, my analogy to help them is usually when you ride a bike or drive a car, do you stare at your hands when you're driving or steering? No, because if you do, you're going to hit something. Same concept when you're using a, an Intuos is when you look at um, when you look at your hands, you're not going to see the screen, right? But you got to look at the screen to see what you're drawing. So that's a little pro tip for anybody out there. Um, speaking of which, uh, what's your your setup? Do you have like a massive PC or something? Uh, so my PC is I wouldn't say it's massive, but uh, I do have a PC. It's a I have a Ryzen nine. And then I have a NVIDIA 2060KO. And yeah, and then, I'm, and then I do also have a Waka Mobile Studio. So, mm -hmm. and that, like before that, I was actually on a MacBook Pro, to be honest mm. with you. I was using that when I was, was creating. Yeah. How, how did that change for you? Like changing from an Intuos to a massive screen, like the 32? So there was a graduate, there was a gradual thing. Um, I can definitely tell you that 
so uh, the first Cintiq I got was a 13 inch. So it went from in tools to a 13 inch and it was cool. Like I was like, oh, this is, this is, this is sweet. That's the best way to explain it. Um, but if I, if I didn't have that Cintiq, I'd still be on my Intuos and I'd still be creating the same piece of artwork. Um, mm. matter of fact, when I was storyboarding, all my storyboard gigs were done on it in tools. But now to answer your question, when I got this Cintiq, the 32, I was like, it was very nostalgic for me because coming mm. from a, a traditional background, I was, uh, figure drawing on like massive, 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 um, uh, uh, pads, I guess you would say. So I'm talking about like four feet drawing pads and I was mm. using like my shoulder. So a lot of times when I hear people talk about um, the Cintiq being too big, I, I kind of like, you're just too small. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like not to make fun of them, I'm like, you're just too yeah. small. And you know, if you're not a, if you're not a, if you haven't been drawing with your shoulders, then I can definitely understand how it is really overwhelming uh, yeah. to do so. Having such a big screen, do you sometimes feel you zooming in too much or do you approach the drawing overall from a very zoomed out canvas and then go into detail later? That's a great question. Um, yeah, honestly, I never, I rarely zoom in at all now because everything's to scale when I use um, the Cintiq Pro. So like right now, like I, have you noticed that I haven't zoomed in at all? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I yeah. noticed, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very smart, Joanna. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, so I would definitely say, um, yeah, I would only zoom in frequently, but it kind of goes with, um, so when you paint another tip, okay, so uh, this is a traditional tip, uh, they always tell you to step back from your canvas to see the bigger picture, right? To see if anything is, if it's correct or um, anything that's wrong, you want to stand back from your, your painting and your drawings. Same concept, but instead I'm just kind of drawing it from a distance. Mm. And uh, yeah, so another thing too, my setup I would say is I'm also um, I'm also like my my Wacom is pretty much 90 degrees too. So that's another mm -hmm. thing I have to say. So it's not lying flat or leaning a little uh, at a 30 degree or 40 degree angle. It's literally close to 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very upright, is what I would say. Do you do you do you still use that? upright angle like from your tr traditional do you used to like draw on an easel or something yep that's exactly what it is i 100 percent uh drew on an easel and mm. it was just it was just i haven't drawn like that digitally ever <laughs> i'm just thinking about it now like <laughs> holy crap like, ever and that's why I'm, that's why i said it's very nostalgic right like i look at oh it okay and yeah i'm like oh memories like you know what i mean like this feels yeah. like cool <laughs> Um, another thing that I noticed um, you drawing now is like you have not once flipped your canvas, which yeah. is a very, very common thing for digital artists. What's yep. that? Um, I understand why they do it, right? But at the same time, as weird as it sounds, it's kind of like you can go two ways, right? Like I get it. You want to make sure everything is looking is looking good. But to me, I think because I'm always constructing it in that way and also like how am i trying to really explain it is your client really going to be flipping your your piece around right so it's kind of like i'm not saying it's wrong it's just that i don't do it because i haven't run into that issue where my 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 pieces are kind of like wonky i guess you would say mm. or or kind of not in place if mm. that makes sense does that make sense yeah Am I making sense? If I'm not making sense, be like, <laughs> you sound like a crazy person. No, no, it, it makes sense, I suppose, if you, especially, I mean, I suppose for, for especially for portraits, like flipping the, the canvas is usually a way to, for one, confirm symmetry to That's a degree. Right. That's right. But see now, isn't it okay? So let's let's talk about that. All right. So <laughs> this is great. I love it. So I'm not debating, but I agree with you. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, would you agree that no human in the world is symmetrically perfect? Well, you have to ask Angelina Jolie about that. You're right. And I knew you were gonna mention her. <laughs> and I did paint her. She's smoking, but at the same time, I guarantee if you were asking her, she'd be like, I'm not perfect. 
oh, or yeah. Brad Pitt. I get it. I get that. hundred <laughs> percent. I get that. But they're still got flaws. All right. No yeah, human, no, no human is perfect. Yeah. And I mean, I, I suppose more interesting portraits are also the ones that aren't like straight on. Yeah. Anyway. So yep. I suppose like getting the perfect symmetrical angle is usually not making for a good portrait. Well, yeah, it, 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 it's sometimes. It, <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, it's it's such a tough, right? It's such a it's such an interesting topic, but it's one of those things where you're like, I feel this is this is what I would say. It's it's sometimes it might make it to feel too stiff, right? Might mm. make your piece too stiff. But again, like I I would I would do that if I'm doing something that that requires it. But most of the time when I'm painting, I I, I haven't run into an issue where someone's like your portrait sucks. And I'm like, cool. And then they're like, you know why it sucks? Why? Because when I flip the canvas, it's all messed up. And I'm like, but when you flip it, you're, you're, you just inverted it. So of course it's going to look messed up, but you know, who am I to argue? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I just make the stuff. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Do you have any, any tips on how to, um, like if you draw a portrait, you have to a certain degree to cop to copy proportions. Um, do you just look at it and? Uh, so no, there's like I, these little yeah. So there's like like I said. So I was telling people earlier about um, my my YouTube video that I did. Hmm. Um, I do talk about that. So when you do boxes, there's actually a way of measuring proportions and measuring. Hmm. So so for instance, um, you know. I'm pretty sure you heard this like three eyes across. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, yeah. Right. Definitely. So when you look at this eye, this three eyes across, this one, it's like I said, when you do manga, you're okay to kind of, you know, exaggerate, right? So mm. so that's why it's really forgiving. So when you do something realistically like a portrait, like could you imagine if this, the top piece that I'm drawing now, the, the more realistic one, like if the eyes were too close, you would be like, uh, yeah. you'd be like, something's wrong with that, <laughs> right? <laughs> like you may, you may be, you may be too nice, and you don't want to say it, but you know, uh, someone in the room is gonna be like, those eyes are messed up, bro. And <laughs> uh, and and I agree, and I would be like, totally agree, hundred percent. And uh, yeah, and I would personally just feel like it's just one of those things that there are little tips like that, or um, okay, here's another tip that I do when it comes to proportions is if you draw a human figure uh, from the pit of their neck to the, so I guess I should just draw it. So, because people are like, what are you talking about? So if you're drawing boxes <laughs> and you draw a rib cage, right? Like if that's the rib cage, okay. The pit of the neck's right there where the clavicle comes out. Okay. So Sorry for my sketchiness, but a thousand lines is always better than can, one. Can, can you can you do the unthinkable and zoom in a little? Oh, of course. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> That's totally <laughs> better. Uh, so again, so when it comes to these kind of proportions here, um, when you look at that box that I had earlier, so what you will learn is that this is your measuring. The head is always the measuring. So your rib cage is one and a half heads. So you would take the length of the, oops, whoa, why did that happen? Uh, da, 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 back down here. You would take the length from up here to down here. Okay, so you would use your fingers, you put it on the top line, put the bottom line, and you would measure one head, and then it would be half, half of that length would be here. So see, I'm even incorrect. So the rib cage would be about that long, right? And then mm -hmm. in between here, right, that little space here, now you can try this, at home uh it's half a hand so if you put your last if you put your knuckles on here and you measure down here this spot to this spot it's literally half your hand so you'll notice that your fingertips will touch the top of your pelvis or your yeah your your, your iliatic crest but your pelvis and then your rib cage here will be touching it but right here this is half half a hand so there's all these kind of like interesting uh interesting kind of uh proportion like ways of finding out so another one that i i don't know if you know um did you know that the so this is perfect for for females and males okay and you can use this and then people are gonna be like i don't believe you 
Um, have you heard of like, if you want to, if, if you don't like trying on pants, have you ever took the, the waistband and wrapped it around your neck? Your neck is the same length as your, your, your waist. I have not heard that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now so, I know. <laughs> now you know, right? So if you don't, everyone take that, take your shorts, take your whatever, wrap it around your neck, like a Superman cape. And you're going to realize that the length of that is the length of your your pelvis is your waist oh, wow. <laughs> all right or another one if you want to do it this way so for here, here's another one okay science ladies and gentlemen science another 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 fun tip with Colin if uh, did you know your forearm from your wrist to the uh, elbow so like inside so where your palm is uh, it is the size of your foot do you know what I'm saying so if I you cross think your, I've heard that. yeah yeah if, if you, you can test it out so cross your legs put your foot right there and it's the size of your forearm so if you have really big feet you also have like really long forearms yeah yeah and but that so that's what this is what I, that's again going back to the symmetry like <laughs> so you know how people have like short legs long legs right like long arms short arms like that that's how you tell when you when you when you start studying anatomy and all these little tips you start to look at people and being like oh look that person has short arms and you're like well how and you're like well look your arm's supposed to technically um, your arm, they say, is like the length of to the mid of your like your fingertips will end up at the mid thigh, mm -hmm. right? So most people will be mid thigh, but if you have short arms and they end up right not even close to the mid of your thigh, then you got short arms. Um, other ways of finding out if people have long legs or short legs is you would cut off the torso like this piece right here, um, and then you would try to measure that exact length down here. And again, if that person has short legs, their legs will end up there and it'll look like mm -hmm. from here, here's the knee and here's the foot. So there was those kind of proportions. So when it comes to um, painting and drawing, those are the little tips that I would definitely tell people. I'd be like, yeah, uh, do you have short or long legs? Do you? But again, it, it helps you with your character design and it gives more character, uh, gives your character more uh, of who they are and stuff like that. So again, mm -hmm. it's, it's funny, but again, I gotta say it. I'm taking real life information. I'm not. I'm not mm. making this up. This is like I like I like I said. Test it out. If you think I'm lying, um, I'm dying. But at the same time, you know, take your pants, wrap it around your neck, and if all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, <laughs> you don't have to go into the uh, to the changing rooms no more. You can just be like, give me my pants. I'm gonna wrap it around my neck. And then people will be like, what is this person doing? You're like, I'm trying it on right now. That's exactly what's happening. Okay. I think yeah. I think we can we can end on that life lesson because we're Perfect. unfortunately out of time. All right. Um, well, yeah, sorry, go ahead. But if you have any last words you would like to say, please do so. Um, I just want to say thanks to you know you, Fahim, Mario, uh, for giving me an opportunity to kind of come in here and uh, do this webinar. Uh, big shout out to also Wacom because they're the ones that introduced me to you guys. So thank you for that. All the people that came in and stayed in, I appreciate all of you. Uh, feel free to hit me up on any of my social media. I'm literally at Colin Chan everywhere. I live stream. You can do that. If you want to uh, contact me uh, to, to help you uh, criti cri criticize your work, I will give you solid criticism and all of those lovely things. But on that, that's it. I had a great time. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. That's it. All right, guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Colin, thank you, Joanna, Mario, thank you to the complete audience for attending our wonderful webinar today uh, and learning uh, new tricks, new things from, uh, from Colin. Um, so with that, uh, if you'd like more information on Clip Studio Paint or would like to know more about Clip Studio Paint, please visit us at clipstudio.net forward slash en or at graphicsly.com. You can also follow us on our YouTube channels where this video recording will be posted. Uh, you'll see the handles there, Celsius Web, Graphicsly as well. Uh, they'll be posted in two different spots. As well, um, as Colin mentioned, if you'd like to get in touch with him or if you'd like to follow him, please visit his social media. Um, pretty much everything is Colin Chan and uh, and that's it. Colin, thank you again, once, once again. No, thank you, Fahim, this was awesome. Love you all, bye. <laughs> Take care bye. and see you guys next time.